Danny in Wisconsin. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Danny? Talk to me. Stephen A. Smith, uh, when you think about the GOAT of sports, you think about Mike with six, Brady with seven rings. But where do you rank a guy like Lightning McQueen with seven Piston Cups? Hmm. I would tell you he wouldn't be the GOAT. How are you going to be the GOAT? Because you talk about the movie Cars, right? You talk about the movie Cars, right? I mean, when you talk yes, about Strip the the King Weathers and, and, and Lightning McQueen, they're both tied with seven Piston Cups. Strip Weathers. You've got about him? How can you be oh, the GOAT? You got somebody that's tied with that. you? You got somebody that's tied with you? Sorry, that ain't going to work. Well, I know you tried to catch me with that. You didn't think I knew that about that. You didn't think I knew no, about no, cars, hey, did hey, you? When you think, you think about okay. when you, you, think you about slept on a brother. Though, not you slept on a brother. Piston cups. He's got 28 circuits. He's got 28 circuits under his Strip belt, too. Strip Weathers has seven Piston Cups. I am not about to sit here and argue with a grown-ass man about the movie Cars. Oh, come on now. Strip Steve. Weathers has seven Piston Cups. You should have yeah, brought me somebody that didn't have as many Piston Cups. old engine cars? Yo, man. Let's talk about guy Lady McQueen. That's like... That's like comparing him to Jerry Danny, West era. You Danny, can't, you can't. Danny, how old are you? I'm 21, Stephen. You're 21. Okay, well, you're still a young man. You're, you're a young man. Uh, what about Fast and Furious? You watch that movie? Yeah, Fast and Furious. Good uh, film. Uh, did you like, which one did you like better, 5, 6, or 7? I mean, 8, 9, and 10 are good, uh -huh. too. But which one did you like better, 5, 6, or 7? Because I like 5 to 7. 5. You like five? five? That, that, yeah. was with, that was with Vin Diesel and, and The Rock going at it when The Rock was trying to hunt him down and all of that other stuff. What I'm saying to you is I think you picked the right one because I liked five a lot. I really, really did. My point is if you're going to argue with me about something, how about it not be an animated movie like Cars? How about it be something like Fast and Furious? I would have appreciated the Stephen question a, better. Cars is as real to little kids as much you're as You're not a little kid! You. You're 21! You would, you would have a point if you were seven years old calling me. You're 21 years old. What are you doing, wearing a diaper? <laughs> Goodbye, man. Next caller, what's up? Hey, what's up, Uncle Steve? This is your favorite nephew, Marcus, out here in Richmond, California. Can you please explain yeah, to the young you men really out there and young women that sex doesn't need to be longer than 11 minutes to be pleasurable? Because there's a bad misconception out here that sex needs to be at least 45 minutes. And as a working man, ain't nobody got time for 45 minutes. We got to get to sleep and go to work. Thank you. My brother, you are not Bernie Mac. Three minutes. That's all I'm giving you. That's all I got. Oh, I don't care about you talking about me. No, you're not Bernie Mac, bro. It's embarrassing. Now, it's happened. Moments where you just don't, you know, like Martin Lawrence said in stand up, run till that. No, no, no. One potato, two potato, three potato trying to hold off. Now that happens to every man. But that can't be the norm, my brother. You going to look at a woman and tell her all you given is 11 minutes? You going to mention that publicly? You have some serious deficiencies in your ability to provide what needs to be provided. If I was a woman, I wouldn't give you none. Hell, if that's the case, beat yourself for 11 minutes. Call it a day. I'm going to give you a damn thing. Cheap ass. 11 minutes, you can do better. Get it together. Next man up, 312 writes, where did you buy that fire shirt, Stephen? By that, I mean you, you mean the shirt is fire. It looks pretty fly. I had it made. You know, you, you can find a tailor nearest you. Take your measurements. Pick out some swats and designs. And have it made. Very, very simple. You understand? If I can do it, you can do it too. There's hope for you, my brother. You understand what I'm saying? And, and by the way, you're a hell of a lot better than an 11-minute man. You're a lot better than an 11-minute man. That brother should be confined to celibacy. He doesn't deserve any. You're going to sit up there and advertise, you know, a man shouldn't have to put in more than 11 minutes. I mean, that's just sorry. That's just sorry. Or you can look at it that way, which is how I'm looking at it. But in his defense, you can also look at it this way. He might think he's so prolific he can get the job done in 11 minutes. But if you thought like that, why would you call up and say so? See what I'm saying? You would like pretend like you're doing your thing for an hour when it's only 11 minutes. You wouldn't advertise that it's just 11 minutes. 
You the eleven minute man. Shit, you ain't even Steve Austin. The Bionic Man, six million dollar man. Eleven minute man. Eleven minutes. I should have asked the ladies what they felt about that. I gotta get some ladies up here in my studio to talk with me about these subjects. You know? I give good advice. I don't follow myself. I talk about myself. But I do give good advice. Um, Kenny, how old are you, man? How old are you? 26. 26. He's 26 years of age. What do you want to do, man? What do you want to do? I mean, based on what you're doing and the kind of noise that you're making um, in, in, in the basketball stratosphere specifically, but obviously beyond that with baseball as well, with all your followers on YouTube, what are you hoping for, man? Well, to be honest with you, Stephen A., I, I want to do, do something similar to what you're doing. Okay. Where as far as, I mean, you love your work. I love my work as far as I'm working and I'm, I, I have a voice in the world as far as the sports world. I mean, you're, you're doing basketball, you're doing everything. And I'm not mm -hmm. there just yet. You know, my, my past has been basketball and I'm I'm getting into those other sports. But I, I want to continue to have a platform where I can talk these things. Um, I don't know if TV traditionally is, is for me, you know, but, but it, it's always evolving. One of the reasons why I feel like I have been able to do what I've done over a long period of time is I'm mm -hmm. taking it one day at a time. Taking mm -hmm. it one day at a time. Um, I got you. And so my goal right now could be different in 24 hours, honestly. Mm, I got you. Well, let me tell you something. First of all, I'm going to bring you back on come playoff time. Okay. That's number one. We're going to do that, number one. And number two, I'm going to leave here in the next 24 hours. I'm going to talk to the bosses. I'm going to plan on having you on first take. I'm gonna have right. a plan on having you on first take. We gonna we gonna come on we gonna come on first take on playoff time and stuff like that. Let the world see you and what you're doing, man. I'm proud of you, man. Keep up the great work. Let's you definitely keep in touch, and definitely I'm gonna have you back on at the very least here and likely first take as well. Come playoff time, man. All the best to you, my brother. That's love, man. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. You take it easy. Megan the Stallion threw out the first pitch in Houston for the Astros. <sighs> I know that there's a lot to walk away from. I mean, that white outfit she was wearing was pretty nice. She looked pretty nice in it. That's one thought to walk away from. The other thought to walk away from is the picture itself, which wasn't that great, but you didn't expect it to be, so props to her. She came close enough. But the one thing I walked away from, and I forgot the guy's name, but he had his hand on her backside. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He could did it quick. But he ain't supposed to be touching her like that. He ain't supposed to be touching her like that. If I was a man, I'd have had a problem with that. I'll tell you that right now. I'm just saying. I understand. But that was naughty. He shouldn't have done that. Keep your hands above waist, around the middle of the back or the upper back. I think that's safe. The lower you go, the lower you seem. That's just a thought. I thought I'd leave y'all with. At Hunch OJT underscore writes, thoughts on Latina women. I love them. I love me a Spanish speaking woman. I really, really, really do. I love it. Now, that ain't all you got to have. You know what I'm saying? You ain't got to have it, but I mean, it is a plus. A bilingual woman, specifically Spanish, whispering in your ear, you know, it's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I will acknowledge that. So no shade on the Latina women whatsoever. Let me throw that out there. Let me throw that out there. Big C, it's called at it's underscore B-I-G-C. He writes, Stephen A, worst day of the week to be horny. Worst day of the week to be horny to me is Sunday night. Because chances are most people got to work Monday morning. And the week hasn't started yet. And a lot of times you want to get, you want to relax, wind down and enjoy the end of the weekend before you get into the muck and mire, the, the, the hustle of the week. I mean, I'm assuming you're going to do what you're going to do several times a week. But the worst day to be. Horny is Sunday. The best day is a Friday and Saturday night. Because Friday and Saturday, she looking to go out in most instances. And if you go out, it's been a wonderful evening. And then you want to close. 
close, as in C-L-O-S-E, not C-L-O-T-H-E-S. You want to close. That's closing. Friday and Saturday night's the best. Sunday's the worst. During the week, take it or leave it based on your mood. But in most instances, a Friday or a Saturday, the expectation is that you're going to be ready to step up and handle your business. That's her expectation, whether she tells you or not. Am I right, Solange? Amen. Amen. It's important because I don't know if y'all know this, but the 81 year old Martha Stewart is one of four swimsuit models gracing the cover of Sports Illustrated. Swimsuit issue. 81 years old. Now, I know y'all saying, what the hell, Stephen? They talking about something like that for. Well, it's a simple reason. Ladies, none of y'all are beyond your prime. All of y'all got it going on. To each their own. What's good for some people ain't good for another. But the door is never closed on any of y'all as long as you're breathing and blood is circulating through those veins. And I want y'all to know that. Now everybody got their own different taste. I have mine. People have theirs. I said I have my taste for a reason. I'm looking for footage to show what my kind of taste looks like. That would be one of them. Let's put that on pause for a second. Russell Wilson. I see why you smiling a lot. And it ain't just because of that 165 million guaranteed portion of your contract you got from the Denver Broncos. Happy wife. Happy life. She ain't the only one, no. Yes. We all have our taste. We all have our taste. <sighs> Lord have mercy. Bravo, Kim. <laughs> you ain't no hater in me, girl. I ain't gonna front. I'm just being honest. Having said all of that, <sighs> Elon Musk mother was on the cover of Sports Illustrated last year. She's 75 years old. You go on, mama. You go on with your bad self. And now it's Martha Stewart. See, Snoop Dogg always says she's got a lot of style and grace. It's a good looking woman right there. 81 years old. I think it's great that Martha Stewart and Mrs. Musk are gracing the same cover that Sierra and Kim Kardashian graced. To each his and her own, there is no prime. Everybody got their taste. I myself don't want to be with somebody that looks like Rasputia from Norbit. My boy Pooley one of my best friends forever in life that I grew up with, Rasputia might be too small. To each his and her own. I like to open a car door for a lady because I was raised by five women and I know my manners. Pooley likes women who tilt cars. To each his own and her own. It's way to go. Some people want to mess with just one kind, white, black, Latina. Others don't discriminate at all. My uncle Frankie, God rest his soul, his criteria had nothing to do with race, ethnicity, or anything like that. Not even beauty. All he cared about was whether or not a woman knew how to help him make money. And if you knew how to help him make money, my uncle Frankie loved you. Loved you. I don't know how they made him like him. He didn't care. 
to each his and her own. I've seen six feet tall women messing with a dude that's five four. I actually once saw a woman with a dude that had no teeth. I have some. Not as perfect as other teeth, but I have some and they're all mine. To each his and her own. That's how I go. I want to end this episode of No Mercy With Your Boy by saying this. Beauty in one's prime is in the eye of the beholder. Who you holding? That's up to you and them. It's not for anybody to judge. We all have hope until it's over. Remember that. What has it been like for you watching this year's version of the New England Patriots, your former team, struggle the way that it has struggled? Two and eight on the season, Mac Jones being screamed at by, you know, Bill O'Brien. I, I mean, I've seen you argue with Bill O'Brien before, so that's nothing new, but I've never seen that. It was just a yeah. bad, bad look for Mac Jones. Yeah. Make no mistake about it. What has that been like for you watching the New England Patriots this year and the way they've struggled? I think it's hard to, to see a team struggle that you care about so many of the people involved. Um, I, I would say this, football is a hard sport. And I think it speaks to when the teams do put it all together and they do a lot of things the right way and you see this sustained success like the Niners did in the 90s, like we were able to do, like the Cowboys were in the 70s uh, and, and the 90s too. The Buffalo Bills, even they're lost. When you, when you do things the right way, you're rewarded for it. And when... Things aren't necessarily the right way. It's hard to win. And, you know, they have a lot of pieces in New England that do do things the right way. But the margin of error is super slim. Right. One one pass, one catch, one interception, one tackle. Winning football games in the NFL is hard. And there's a lot of I, I think there's a lot of mediocrity in today's NFL. Yeah. I don't see the excellence that I saw in the past. Why not? And hope why not? Why I, do you I think, think that is? I think the coaching isn't as, as good as it was. I don't think the development of young players is as good as it was. I don't think the schemes are as good as they were. I think the the, fish, the rules have a, the rules have allowed a lot of bad habits to get into the actual performance of the game. Mm-hmm. So I just think the product, in my opinion, is less than what it's been. I think guys are competitive. Guys play hard. I look at a lot of players like Ray Lewis and Rodney Harrison and Ronnie Lott. And guys that impacted the game in, in a certain way, and every hit they would have made would have been a penalty. Mm. You know, and I, I, you know, your coach is complaining about their own player being tackled, and not necessarily why don't they talk to their player about how to protect himself, how to get rid of the ball, how to throw it, how to run out of bounds, how to get down, how to lower your pad level. I, we used to work on the fundamentals of those things all the time. Now they're trying to be regulated all the time. Mm. You know, I think the the offensive players need to protect themselves. It's not up to the defensive player to protect the offensive player. A defensive player needs to protect himself. He shouldn't ask the offensive player to protect him. And I think a lot of the way that the rules have come into play have allowed this. You can essentially play carefree, and then if anyone hits you hard, there's a penalty. And it's very different than how I play. We, I didn't throw the ball to certain areas because I was afraid players were going to get knocked out. Mm-hmm. That's the reality. Wow. I didn't throw it to the middle when I played Ray Lewis because you knock him out of the game, and I couldn't afford to lose a good player. So – Guys like that, the only the only way to beat skill was physicality, mm. and that was a physical sport. You don't get into a boxing match and say, "I want to beat you, but I don't really want to hit you that hard." <laughs> you know, it's up to you. As if, now the rest there to make sure nothing is done unfairly, or you know, hit below the belt. There's a few rules. Right. I believe that if players have an opportunity to protect themselves, they need to protect themselves. Am I off kilter when I said this? Because I've said this publicly. I certainly would never advocate that Bill Belichick be gone. He's the greatest coach, arguably the greatest coach to to have ever lived, and there is no debating that. What I have said, however, is that just like you thought it was time for you to move on, there may be, it may come a point where Bill Belichick thinks it's, thinks it's time for him to move on to something new and for New England to start anew because the era of Tom Brady and Bill Belichick has passed. Am I off kilter or any of us off kilter in your mind when we say something like that? I think he's an incredible coach. He's the best coach, in my belief, in the, in the history of the game. So, I mean, I don't know. Get, 
Uh, the thought of him not being in New England is hard for me to think about. Wow. So I, I think he's he's he prepares the team really well. And ultimately, you got to have a lot of people around you to succeed. You got to have a lot of things in place for the organization to be successful. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's probably coaching much difference now than when we were undefeated in 2007. Right. I'm sure he's preparing the team the same way. The results are different. But again, that's why the sport's so challenging. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reasons why teams win or lose. The head coach is a very small part on game day. Yes. And the quarterback plays a really big part on game day. Not mm -hmm. the entire thing, but because you touch the ball, you have a big opportunity to impact the game. So if you get good quarterback play, and that says nothing about, the, you know, I'm just talking in general about football, right. you know, you got an advantage. If you play really good defense, you got a, a, a great advantage. I mean, you need a good defensive coordinator. You know, there's a – Ultimately, it's a lot of things coming together, why things work and why they don't. Let me transition. Josh Hart of the New York Knicks. You know, <clears throat> it's no reason to talk about a Knicks basketball player at this particular moment in time because they're relevant. The NBA Finals are coming on, and for <sighs> the latest time, they're not involved. Knicks haven't been in an NBA Finals since 2000. Haven't won a championship since 1973. By the time, I, I, by the way, I was six years old at that, five years old at that particular moment in time. It's 50 years ago. Um, we understand. But this is a funny thing to bring up about the New York Knicks and Josh Hart, because I don't know if y'all have heard the news about him. But um, Josh Hart sent out some kind of tweet or whatever asking folks if we'd ever taste breast milk. Breast milk. That's what he said. Now, <clears throat> I've never been inclined to taste breast milk. I like breast. You don't have to be a baby to like breast. Matter of fact, one could easily argue there are adults who like breast more than babies. However, breast milk is a different matter. He asked that question. I'm like, I mean, damn, damn, Josh. What the hell? And then I started laughing. Because I thought about a clip from Dave Chappelle that I thought was hysterical from years ago. And that made me chuckle. Watch this, y'all. That was Josh Smith of the New York Knicks. No wonder why Jalen Brunson said lose the number. Lose the number. Because of the wild stuff he brings up and the wild questions he asks. Josh Hart is a weird one. But he is somebody I hope remains a New York Knick. I like his effort. I like his feistiness. He was an added, not a minus. I like that. There was a story that I addressed the other day about this girl, clearly entitled, at the very least coming across as very, very tri trifling and entitled, was like, I, ah, look at me, look at me. I cannot go into a cheesecake factory. Looking like she's been there many times, by the way, although she looked good. But the point is, is that's what she said. And so, if you don't believe me, I wanted to revisit this subject because there's some people who sent in a list of places you can't go and you shouldn't go on a first date. And I said, I'm going to address that list. But before I do that, I wanted to rehash for y'all that video she put out on social media going on a first date, talking about she can't go to a Cheesecake Factory. And then my response to her flagrant level of entitlement. Listen to this. I, I you really don't said. understand. Look at me. I cannot go in the Cheesecake Factory. There's nothing wrong I, with I will die. That's okay. embarrassing. First of all, what the hell is wrong with the Cheesecake Factory? Ain't nothing wrong with the Cheesecake Factory. Not only is there nothing wrong with the Cheesecake Factory, the Cheesecake Factory ain't that damn cheap. Now, having said all of that, I'm here for y'all, ladies. I'm here for you. I'm just trying to be here for you. I'm just trying to be here for you, okay? I'm just trying to be here for you. Our, uh, there are places, honestly speaking, that you shouldn't go for a first day. Fair enough. But what I would like to say to the ladies out there is that it all depends on the man you're with and what his budget entails. If you decide to go out on a date with a dude that's jobless and he take you to some place like Applebee's, damn it, that's like 
Morton Steakhouse or something. That's like catching Hollywood or Craig's or from Melrose and stuff. I mean, yo, it's like Mercer's Kitchen in New York City. That's not a bad, I mean, it all depends on your budget. Now, if you're making a lot more money and you decide to be cheap, that's a different animal. So it all depends on your budget. But we're going to address this list by saying this is applicable to men out there who have a nine to five job at the very least. And let's just say is making 75000 and up annually, even though that's cut in half after taxes, after Uncle Sam gets a hold of you, depending on the city that you live in. But you know what I'm saying? Let's go down the list. Cheesecake Factory. No problem whatsoever. The menu is good. The ambiance is good. I'm cool with it. Ain't nothing wrong with Cheesecake Factory. That girl smoking something. And by the way, I think she lying. Don't tell me you can't go in no Cheesecake Factory. Stop lying. You know you're good and damn well. I saw you. I saw the video. You, 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 you've been to Cheesecake Factory before. Ain't no doubt you've been to Cheesecake Factory before. You need to stop. Ain't a black person alive that ain't walk into a McDonald's or a Burger King. Hell, it's White Castle if you ask me. So don't even tell me that you ain't go to a Cheesecake Factory. And by the way, I don't eat the White Castle as much anymore and stuff like that. You know, I got myself in shape, got myself in condition and all of this other stuff. But I have to admit, it's the best laxative I've ever ate in my life. I got to tell you that right now. I'm just telling y'all that. I know it's TMI, but hey, you got to go to the bathroom. First of all, it tastes delicious. And secondly, it helps you unleash. It's a very, very good thing. You understand what I'm saying? It's just a laxative I think you should think about. Number one. Number two. I'm only playing. I want to do that to White Castle. Burgers are delicious. I try to go there all the time before I, you know, got in the gym. Applebee's. Eh, I like Applebee's. I've been to Applebee's on many occasions. You know, first date, no, but hell, I was just there a month ago. Me and my sister Sumatra, we got hungry and went to the Applebee's. What's wrong with Applebee's? The double burgers are nice. Double cheeseburgers are nice. You know what I'm saying? I like it. I like it better than their steaks, but I like it. Chili's? Hell. There's Chili's all over Bristol, Connecticut. When I was at ESPN, you're damn right I went to Chili's. Yep. Chipotle? Uh, not my cup of tea. I'm not minding. Olive Garden. Ain't nothing wrong with the Olive Garden. Olive Garden is nice. Now, the movies is a different animal. See, if you want to have conversation, you don't go to the movies because you're watching the movies. You can't talk. But if you want to take her someplace nice, but you don't want to talk, you got to take her to movies. But it can't be just any movie theater. It's got to be one of those AMC movie theaters or those I pick theaters that serve you food and bring it to your seat. Oh, my God. Oh, oh I mean, when they bring the food to your seat, I mean, you ain't got to move. It's right there. They bring the food and bring and they serve alcohol, too. You know, you can get I got a Hennessy and Coke at the movie theater. That's nice. That's nice. All right. So the movies are the joint, just depending on what type of movie that your house. Stop it, fellas. You know, good. Look, you can't be showing that you're trying to get someone the first day. You got, you got to disguise that a little bit. You know what I'm saying? We know you're trying to get some. That's why you took it out on a date. We know that, right? But you don't need to be obvious with it the first day. You know what I'm saying? You have to, you know, massage the situation a little bit. You know, you got to show you want to spend some money. You know, take it out. Nice conversation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let her know you're interested in her words. You ain't necessarily looking at them hips, them legs, the booties, the breasts, and all of that stuff that comes with it. You got to disguise that a little bit. Look up sometimes. Don't look straight. Don't look that. Just look up sometimes. You understand what I'm saying? Make it don't let it look. Don't let it don't be so obvious. You know? And then when you look at her a little bit, look quick. Smile. Let her know you like what you see in a very classy, upstanding way. And then divert your eyes away again. Cause she don't want to be objectified. She don't want to be objectified. Okay. You know how she is. I, I'm, more, I'm more than I am more than that. Okay, is that all you want? That's all you want. I'm not interested in that. Okay, I don't need that. You do have those. Plentiful, I might add. Most women can be like that. You know, they might want you. I think women know relatively quickly whether or not you got a chance. But in the same breath, she might not want to be obvious about it. Your house makes it obvious. You might not want to do that. And that's not to say if she chooses to come over your house, that means something's going to happen. Because we don't want to send that message either. No means no. No means no. No fast food chains. That's cheap. Can't do that. No Buffalo Wild Wings for a first date. Unless she's somebody like Rasputia that want those wings. 
folks. You do have that. From Norbit, Rasputia, the movie Norbit. You do have those women. I mean, hell, you know. They can eat a whole chicken and be like, what's that? I'm just, that's just an appetizer. Wingstop, nah, that's cheap. Red lobster's not bad. Depends on the ambiance at particular red lobsters. Red lobsters sometimes, they vary. A buffet, hell no. Hell no. Food just laying there. People walking by, breathing on it and all that shit. You can't do that. IHOP, no. That's that, that IHOP is cheap. It's a nice place for breakfast. But you ain't going on your first date for breakfast. Okay? It's usually late in the day. And if it's late in the day, that ain't breakfast food. Okay? Denny's, no. The gym? Well, you just telling her she need work. That ain't going to work on the first date. Church? Now, that has potential. I believe in the Lord. And the Lord has connected me with you. And because that has happened as I sit here right now, and I know we can go out to dinner, we can go out and have a good time. But if you will escort me, I'd like you to come with me to church because I just want to go and give thanks to the Lord that I've met you. That's how you do that. Outside of that, not church. Because one of two things is going to happen if she's not religious. Either she's going to be turned off because she was turned on and you brought her into an environment that sort of quelled her st stimulation, per se. Or she just might think you're leaning on the church for help because you can't handle your business on your own. That is not good. You know what I'm saying? And you come in there and then, you know, you might want, you know, you might be very, very serious, want the ring and all of that stuff. She might think, He's moving too fast. I don't know if I'm ready for this. No Starbucks, no coffee dates, no ice cream dates. Family function. She ain't earned that. She don't know. You don't know. You don't know her well enough to bring around your family. Movie night. Eh. No long drives. Not yet. Bowling's cool. No nightclub. That gives another brother an opportunity to hook up with her. You don't want that hookah bar. She might not like to smoke. A bar for just drinks. There's other men there. You don't want that distraction. Waffle House, that's like breakfast. Sporting events are cool as long as you got dinner after. Remember I said that. It's Stevie A talking to you. You know my advice is off the chain. Shade room, you watching. Ladies, you looking. Pay attention to your boy Stephen A. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to be there for you. I'm trying to be there for you. I'm just saying. Um, yesterday reading some stuff with some whole gender reveal thing going on. Um, the name Zion Williamson came up. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Zion Williamson is a star player for the New Orleans Pelicans. That's who he is. Um, he's in the news on the internet for the wrong reasons because apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, looking at my team, he's about to be a daddy. He's about to be a dad. He's about to be a dad. And uh, uh, the person who's about to make him a new father is not the person that was on social media talking about him. Now I know that it's my job to talk about the news, but I pride myself in not getting into people's personal business like that. I talk sports, I talk news, I talk current events, stuff like that, but I kind of refrain from the personal because there are certain lines that can't be crossed. But I do have an obligation to say this much. Uh, Rob, apparently a girl by the name of Mariah Mills is all over the internet and calling him out by name, attaching his name to stuff and saying, giving vivid details of their encounters with one another. She's a porn star. Now, 
Y'all gonna sit up there and say, damn, where's Stephen A going with this? Where am I going? <sighs> Are you ready for this? I'm kind of pissed. I'm kind of pissed off. Because all I can think about is, man, you only played 29 games last year. And you missed the season before that. And I've been wondering what the hell is taking you so long to get healthy. Well, now I know. I mean, you know, forget all this stuff. That's his personal business. She put it out there. It's a damn shame. My advice to you youngins out there, you can't always police what your partner is going to do. What's going to be publicized, what's not going to be publicized. You got to cancel them immediately if they're willing to betray your trust like that. I know I would. Second order of business is that chances are if you mess with a porn star, it's going to be public. I don't call Jimmy Garoppolo porn star Jimmy for nothing. The man went to a damn restaurant in Mel Melrose. And right, uh, I'm sorry, right there in Beverly Hills with the porn star. Clearly you wanted everybody to know you, you porn star Jimmy. Porn star Zion doesn't exactly ring the same way as porn star Jimmy. But that porn star didn't talk about Garoppolo the way this one is talking about Zion. And I'm not going to repeat what she said. It's not appropriate, even for YouTube. I'm not doing it. I'm just not. I'm not. Because I don't care. You're young. You're not married. You can do what you want to do with whomever you choose. It's your business. It's a damn shame she's putting your stuff out like that. You need to cancel her. But there's a bigger issue here. I mean... She's a porn star. Well, one would surmise she's kind of an expert at whatever it is she does. And, uh, uh, you know, I've been waiting for the leg injury to cure to, to heal, Zion. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for a while. he have been waiting for a while. New Orleans has been waiting for a while. I mean, we've been waiting, man. I'm not going to get into all of this. I'm just going to say, yo, man, when you going to play? I ain't, forget her. Forget all that. That's your personal business. When you going to play, Zion, in 29 games, you missed the game, of the game before. Your first season, you only played 21 games. Your second season, you missed 21 games. You played 24 games your first season, missed 21 your second season, didn't play your third season, and only played 29 out of 82 games your fourth season. I mean, damn, bro. No wonder you, no wonder you ain't healthy. I'm talking about your legs. I'm talking about your legs. I'm just saying, man. Y'all focus on the wrong thing. Get your minds out of the gutter. That's his business. What I'm concerned about is we need those legs spry. We need you bench pressing with your big self. We need you bench pressing about 400 pounds. We need you running up and down that court. New Orleans needs you healthy. Do you understand that if you were healthy this year, Zion Williamson, New Orleans could be in the finals. Y'all could have beat Denver. You, C.J. McCulloch, Brandon Ingram, Valentunas and those boys, you could have beat Denver. Y'all weren't even in the equation because you weren't healthy. Zion Williamson, ladies and gentlemen, Zion Williamson, in the last two seasons that he's played, the man has averaged 27 points on 61% shooting from the field and 26 points on 60% shooting from the field. He's a man child. But you can't get healthy. Your lower extremities. were compromised. Some people will say evidently not all of them. I am not going there. I am simply saying, I want to see you play. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. We see you back on the court, bro. Stories like this will fade into the twilight when you get back on the court.
But if you can't get back on the court because your legs just ain't right, let's just say this story might give folks cause to pause as to why you can't seem to get yourself healthy. Before I get into the NBA Finals, let me revisit a conversation that I had last week or a, con a discussion that I had last week about Shannon Sharp real quick. I meant what I said. I respect the brother. And if he wants to come on first take, I'm here for it. I support him. He wants to go elsewhere, that's fine. He wants to get his own show and he's got his own aspirations, I'm fine with that too. Um... And whatever happened with him and Skip Bayless is their business. I know nothing about it and don't want to know. The only reason I brought it up is because it was announced that he had been bought out by Fox. Otherwise, I would have never broached that subject because I would never disrespect Skip Bayless like that. Having said all of that, let me say this. Got a lot of respect, again, for Shannon Sharp. But make no mistake about it, I love my crew. Ryan Clark. The Pivot, plus an extraordinary NFL analyst. It's my brother, Keyshawn Johnson. That's my dog. We go back decades. It's my man. Swagoo, Marcus Spears, my man. Bart Scott, no doubt. Dan Orlovsky, my brother from another mother. I hope Jeff Saturday comes back. Mina Kimes and, you know, I mean, just a whole list of crew of folks contributed to the NFL. Kimberly Martin, the whole crew. And we know how I feel about the playmaker, Michael Irvin. I don't know what's going to happen with him. I don't know what his situation is. I haven't spoken to him in a while. There's not much on this planet Earth I would not do for Michael Irvin. That's my brother. I love him to death. And I think he makes great television. And I would never, ever, ever sit up there and tell anybody that I want anybody more than I want Michael Irvin. It's just that things that are going on are out of my control. Whether it's the NFL, it's the NFL Network, it's ESPN, I don't know. And I don't have any control over that. That's beyond my pay grade. But as I said before, I welcome Shannon Sharp to first take. But it would be in the mix of being a part of the family. I'm not looking for an everyday person on first take. So for all of you clamoring for that, get over it. Don't work that way. I'll happily help him get his own show or anybody else that wanted their own show. I'll do everything I can to help them in that regard, although I have no control over that. But when it comes to first take, I like the potpourri of contributors. I like the action and the excitement and the fun on the show. Adding people into the mix is one thing. Changing the complete makeup and formula of the show is entirely different. And that ain't happening for anyone. Because I love too many of my brothers and sisters that contribute to the show, both white and black, male and female, all of that, to deviate from that, just to get that straight. Mark Jackson is not only a former colleague, he's a friend. I've known him for many years. I wasn't blessed and fortunate enough to know him when I was growing up in Hollis, Queens, New York, and he was right down the block near Murdoch Avenue in O'Connell Park, where he grew up just a few blocks away. I looked up to him. I was never the player that he was. I was never the basketball mind that he was. And everybody has to find their own way. But one of the greatest honors of my career is that I've come to know him and to be able to call him a friend. So I will openly confess to you, to everybody out there, that, yeah, you can accuse me of a bit of bias. Fair enough. But what's happening to him and what has been happening to him is utter bullshit. And y'all are full of shit. And you know exactly who the hell I'm talking to when I say that. Every chance you get, you throw out rumors about him. And I'm not going to even denigrate or sully his name by bringing up what those rumors have been over the years. It spanned years. 
Nobody ever takes the time to say, well, if it were true, even if those rumors were true, oh, it was years ago. It was years ago. Now, I remember when he got fired from the Golden State Warriors. And there's not much shade we can throw on the Golden State Warriors because the successor was Steve Kerr, who happens to be one of the top five coaches in the history of basketball, so far as I'm concerned. But you got people who despised Mark Jackson, who would tell you Clay Thompson and Steph Curry may have never been what they ultimately became had it not been for Mark Jackson and the tutelage he provided and how it set the stage for Steve Kerr to piggyback off of and ultimately elevate not just the franchise, not just them, but himself to astronomical heights as a coach and a basketball mind in the game of basketball. And no shade on Steve Kerr whatsoever for another reason. The man was a champion before he got to Golden State. He was a champion as a player in Chicago. He was a champion as a player in San Antonio. And if Tom Thibodeau had listened to him, I'm sorry, if Mike D'Antoni had listened to him and allowed Tom Thibodeau to come to Phoenix and be the defensive coordinator when Steve Kerr was running basketball operations in Phoenix, Phoenix might have won the title one year with Amari Stoudemire and the Matrix, Sean Marion and Steve Nash and all of those brothers. They might have done it, but it didn't happen. I say all of that to say ain't no problem. Don't, nobody's trying to throw any shade on Steve Kerr whatsoever. But there's something to be said about somebody teaching you how to crawl and walk before you ultimately learn to run and sprint. And that is what Mark Jackson did. For a lot of other people, it would have been enough to get another job. But for somehow, some way, for some reason, Mark Jackson gets ostracized. It really pisses me off. It really does. Because it's grotesquely unfair. This man, 98 and 66, his last two seasons coaching in Golden State, 2012 to 2014, and can't get another job all of these years? Really? But nobody wants to bring that up. Because every time he comes close, it could be Sacramento, it could be New York, it could be somewhere. There's always some damn rumor that's coming out. Did it ever occur to some of you people out there? What if people like myself and others who covered the NBA for the last quarter century started putting out the rumors that are out there about other people? Ladies and gentlemen, I know people who've been accused of some unsavory things that are working in professional basketball. I know somebody that was fired. I take that back. I know several people who were fired for having adulterous affairs. And somebody grabbed them and gives them life and ultimately elevate them. I've known people, I know people that are working in professional sports right now that have been accused of some of the most egregious things that were unlawful, that harmed other human beings. And they've been on camera talking to y'all, and y'all have no idea about them, but we do. By we, I mean those of us who cover the league. I'm getting sick and damn tired. Every time Mark Jackson wants something or got something going on, when none of those accusations are applicable to him, and yet somehow, some way, they want to get in the way of this man trying to earn an honest living. Where's your compassion? Where's your decency? He don't have a right to go out there and earn a living? Now, let me be very, very clear. I'm talking about as a basketball coach. I work for ESPN. I was not happy when Mark Jackson was let go. I don't have any control over that. I think he's an outstanding analyst, but I also know Doc Rivers is one too. And I know Doris Burke is a Hall of Famer. She's sensational. And I love the job that J.J. Reddick and, and Richard Jefferson are doing. And, and their promise is endless. Their promising pr the prospects are endless. They are special. And I want to state for the record, I miss Jeff Van Gundy. There's certain things that are above my pay grade. 
And decisions are made in corporate America every day. I keep telling y'all about that. Where the money reside, where the money reside, where the money reside, where the money reside. Okay? Yes, I get it. But the point is, is that in the throes of business, evidently all of these years Mark Jackson was doing this job, he was good for business. You working for ESPN and ABC, calling NBA final games, and all of a sudden you can't call Knicks games? Of course something's fishy. But why I got to be him? We are talking about James Dolan. That's his franchise. We are talking about Leon Rose, who's the president of the franchise. That's his franchise. We are talking about Tom Thibodeau, the coach, who every year feels like a hot seat to him. We are talking about that. Stephen A. Smith would not be saying anything if I looked around and I saw that this happens to everybody. Because fair is fair. But we know that ain't true. It's happening to him. Now, I know some of you saying, where he going with this? Oh, is he going to bring up race? No. Because I don't have to. Like I said, it ain't happening to anybody else. Why is happening to him? You literally got people trying to keep this man from being employed, lying on him at every turn, embellishing stories, or even if they're telling the truth about some things, stuff from years ago, like they can move on from their past, but he can't. Y'all are full of shit, and your day's gonna come. Because a lot of people may not know who you are, but I do. Remember that. Remember that. What happened to him last year at the Oscars was one of the most disgusting things that I've ever seen happen. In all the years that I've been watching television. It was so egregious. It was so bad. What Will Smith did to this brother. Slapping him. On stage. At the Oscars. With millions upon millions of people watching. And then. Screaming at him from his seat. On several occasions, keep my wife's name out your bleeping mouth and all of this other stuff. I'm going to reveal a couple of things. When that happened, I had instantly gone on social media and I was like, please don't tell me I saw what I just saw. Because it wasn't clear in the immediate moment whether or not it was a joke, it was a skit, it was something that happened, all this other. It wasn't clear. It wasn't clear at all. But I suspected it was as real as it evidently ended up being and to watch Will Smith do that let me go a step further there's a guy by the name of Charlie Mack people in the know know who Charlie Mack is it's my brother love him like a brother that's my man and for years He was a bodyguard of Will Smith's. He's a close confidant of Will Smith. He loves Will Smith more than life itself. And he picked up the phone and called me because he thought I was going to be on the air the next day, but I happened to be on vacation that week. And the reason he called me, he said, compassion, Stephen A., understanding, mercy. He said, This brother has been doing this for 35 years and never slipped up. This is the first time he ever did that. And I can tell you right here, right now, that's the primary reason I didn't come off vacation just to dedicate a show to go in on Will Smith on First Take Live on national television. That's the only reason. Because Charlie Mack called me. Because I thought what Will Smith did was that egregious. 
And I was literally en route to vacation when we were watching the Oscars. And that happened. Even my teenage daughters called me and said, Dad, did you see it? Did you see it? Did you see it? They couldn't believe it. Because they know how much I love Will Smith. I only had the pleasure of meeting Will Smith on a couple of occasions in my lifetime. I interviewed him before his movie Concussion came out years ago. Will Smith has always been class personified. One of the best people you could ever meet. And as stunned as I was, I was so appalled. Boy, well, folks, lucky I wasn't on the air the next morning. I almost called, I almost decided to come off vacation to just pop on the air just to address that subject. That's how egregious it was. My heart went out to Chris Rock because it was so incredibly embarrassing. But my anger and my disgust towards Will Smith extended beyond Chris Rock. Chris Rock was a given. First of all, as Charlie Murphy, the late, great Charlie Murphy, God rest his wonderful soul, said with his brilliance and comedy, you know, doing the whole Rick James thing on the Dave Chappelle show, you know, you don't slap a man. So that was bad in and of itself. But to me, it resonated far deeper than that. Because, ladies and gentlemen, a black man was producing the Oscars for the first time. His, his name would happen to be the great Will Packer. See, we talked about it, but we talked about it in passing. We didn't address it with the fervor and the passion that it deserves. A black man had never had the opportunity to produce the Oscars. This was the first time. And Will Smith didn't just show up there because of the Oscar that he was scheduled to win because of his phenomenal performance in King Richards. Playing the father of Venus and Serena Williams. And chronicling and highlighting and depicting their upbringing and his mission to make them two of the greatest stars in the history of sports. And in Serena's case, the GOAT. It was about what he had to endure and what he was willing to endure to get them to that point. And Will Smith depicted that in brilliant fashion. And there's no question that he was worthy and deserving of the Oscars to win an Academy Award. But that wasn't the only reason he showed up there. That wasn't the only reason Denzel Washington showed up there. That wasn't the only reason Tyler Perry showed up there. Questlove was going to win something himself. That wasn't the reason he showed up there. You had people in abundance, black, white, and beyond, that wanted to witness the Oscars because it was being produced by a black man for the first time. And Will Packer put on a sensational show, cementing for all of us his greatness as a producer and all the work that he put in and all the things that he had to oversee. The music, the performers, everything was his responsibility. You have any idea the resistance he faced? You have any idea what he had to go through to make sure that Oscars was one of the greatest, which it was. And by the way, restored ratings after years and years of dipping in the ratings. Will Packer did that. And barely any of us got to talk about it because of what Will Smith did. So outside of slapping a man, outside of slapping a black man, he also tainted the moment for Will Packer. And I'm sure the calls came thereafter and he apologized for what he did. And I'm quite sure Will Smith was sincere. 
But it didn't stop her from accepting the Oscars. It didn't stop her from being up there crying, giving a speech during the Oscars. It didn't stop her from being seen partying with this family hours after knowing what he did. Now, had it been me, ladies and gentlemen, I would have did the same thing Chris Rock did. 